I really fundamentally believe from a climate point of view, technology point of view, last mile health, all that, it is that balance of we got to get people on the bus we, and then we can build better routes, more routes, more people, more routes, more people, and then more attention to things that tie into the bigger picture about location, land use development, last mile, all those other pieces, you know. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Dan Hendry with the Get On The Bus program, inspiring a youth transit revolution. Uh, Dan is up in the Kingston, Ontario area, uh, just north of the border there in Canada. And we are gonna be talking about this really, truly inspiring program uh, that he helped uh, establish. Uh, so let's get right to it with Dan. Dan Hendry, thank you very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having me. Dan, I love giving my uh, guests the opportunity just to quickly introduce themselves. So who the heck is uh, Dan Hendry? Well, I got a couple hats on today, even though you can't see them. Um, one is uh, I'm the Sustainable Initiatives Coordinator for Limestone District School Board, which is a public school board in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Um, but from the work which we're going to be talking about today, I'm actually also the co-founder and project director of Get on the Bus, uh, which is a movement driven by a charity in Toronto called the Small Change Fund. I love it. I love it. I love it when people wear multiple hats. It makes it fun. <laughs> Lots of irons in the fire, you know, keeping things interesting. You, know, you never want to get too bored. I, I can tell you that. That's a, I never really am bored at all. <laughs> well, I had to look up where the heck Ken Kingston, Ontario is, uh, because you and I have never met. You just reached out to me and said, hey, I'm doing this really cool program. I've been engaged and involved with this since uh, 2012, and I'd love to tell you about it. And I took one look at it and replied back to you. Heck yeah, man, let's get you on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I thanks so much for giving me the opportunity too. I just love sharing the story because it's just so applicable. And it's not just in Canada. It's literally, there's a master's thesis done on this work and it could be applied to mid-sized communities all over North America. So thanks for giving me an opportunity to chat. Yeah, yeah. And I just pulled up on screen here uh, for the audience, the uh, visual of where the heck you are. Uh, again, Kingston, Ontario, way up northeast here um, off of Lake Ontario, right at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Fascinating. I've never been to that part of North America. Uh, how the heck did you find your way to Kingston, Ontario? Well, actually, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've been around the world a bit through studies and travel. Um, grew up in a smaller town, actually, uh, but my family's from the area, my mom's side. So, you know, I was traveling overseas for about 10 years. Uh, so when I came back to settle, I picked a spot that was, you know, big and small, had the amenities close to Syracuse, New York, and, and Toronto, and Montreal, Ottawa. So just in the middle, but gives you, there's less traffic, let's put it that way. So my commute home is never too bad, you know. So we're going to be talking a lot about transit, engaging youth to use transit. How big is the metropolitan area that we're talking about here? Yeah, we're talking about uh, a bit of a flux. Like there's some post-secondary institutions and a, and a military base, but generally I'd say about 160, 180,000 people type of thing, depending on the time of year. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. And I see, you know, based on the, 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 the map here and the satellite imaging, it looks like it's a, a pretty well contained, uh, area development area. And then it looks like, uh, most of the Ontario that, uh, I'm used to, um, which is a lot of farmland. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and actually one thing about Kingston, it's actually uh, an old city hall, you know, so it was built on the mouth of St. Lawrence. It was actually Canada's first capital city actually for a couple of years there. And so that's just that strategic, you know, back in the day while they were coming over and looking to set up places, definitely, um, you know, the urban area is contained, right, by by Lake Ontario, as well as kind of as we get going a bit more northern into the farmland and uh, to the Canadian Shield as well. Yeah. And, uh, and I was also trying to get my bearings and, and, you know, cause I've spent some time in Toronto. Uh, I did my master's uh, degree at the university of uh, Michigan in, in Arbor. And I would cool. pop over to see some friends of mine that lived, uh, in the, the province of Ontario. And so I have spent a little bit of time there, but it, it was interesting to, to see that Kingston is like halfway between Montreal and 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 Toronto. And so that gave me a little bit of a bearing on that because um, I've also visited and profiled the cycling infrastructure up in, in the city of Montreal. Yeah, that stuff's pretty special there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic work. Now, um, so you, you mentioned you had traveled around a, a fair amount. 
settled back into the, the Kingston area there. And um, w- what was that story? How did you sort of get involved then in, uh, in, in schools and school districts and then and ultimately starting to really get engaged with teaching about and engaging youth with transit? Yeah, no, it's, uh, so I'll take you over to Sweden quickly in 2007 uh, when I graduated from a master's of strategic leadership in sustainability. So I have a background in commerce as well as sustainability. You know, I'm just looking at 8 billion people. We live on this spaceship. Uh, we're mammals, right? We have some constraints that we don't always pay attention to, I think. Um, and just knowing that, it kind of came back to Canada in 2009, um, you know, after I went back to Korea for a couple of years to teach. So always engage in youth in some some aspect, you know. Um, but when I came back, I was looking for work. And, you know, the word sustainability and climate action, these weren't maybe in the norm as much back then. And so... Yeah, I started to work in Kingston um, at a part-time job at the school board, which I still have, the, the public board here. And there was just an opportunity in 2012. And so, you know, sometimes you don't know. I, well, it's funny when you look back and you can find points in your life that have changed your life, right? And, and it was a decision um, by city council and the trustees from the board that said, well, why don't we let grade nines ride for free? Now, so I had two part-time jobs. I worked actually for the city in sustainability and for the school board working on different kind of different projects. Uh and I went to the director of education and said, listen, there's this policy change. Who's going to teach them? Who's helping? Right. We're a mid-sized community. We're not using as many, uh, you know, transit wasn't always the, the, the norm. And so that's something we kind of set out to change at a point where I didn't know it was going to be successful. But, uh, yeah, we're doing pretty well here. I love it. I love it. Now, we're going to play a video here, which we may or may not get flagged for on the music. If we do get flagged for it, uh, then this will all get edited out and, and won't be part of uh, the conversation. But if it, if we're successful and we can play this video, it's it's a great encapsulation of what it is. That, and it tells a little bit of that story. So uh, if you'll indulge me, I'd, I'd love to play this video, um, which is through, I, I think, the site Climate Reality. Yeah, it's Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. So yeah, take it away. Let's let's check it out. All right, cool. Public transit deserves to be at the center of our communities. But there's a problem. For years, it's been stigmatized and we built around the automobile. But more importantly, people aren't using it. You need people for good public transit but you need good public transit for people. And that's what we set out to change. When local politicians realized that there'd be an opportunity to give grade nines free access to the buses, we decided, well, we should train them, we should teach them. And we created the Kingston Transit Bus Pass program in which all grade nine students get trained on a moving bus. And now grade nine, 10, 11, 12 ride for free. What has that done? Well, the first year there were 28,000 rides. There's now almost 600,000 rides by high school students in our community. Like any program, there were challenges, but we listened and that's the key. We paid attention to students, teachers, principals, parents, politicians, transit operators. And every year we listened and we built the program better to satisfy what we're trying to do, which is grow ridership and get students comfortable on the bus. So it's a great opportunity to talk to students about etiquette, of being in a public place, safety, but really it's about building their confidence and understanding and building a community around using transit. One thing I tell students is, I'm not just giving you a bus pass today, I'm giving you freedom. And that really resonates with students. Getting to school, jobs, I say first dates or volunteering, it opens up and creates a more accessible community. I got this bus pass for free and it changed my life. My hopes and dreams for the Kingston Transit High School Bus Pass program is one more community, and then one more community all over the world. When you engage youth, you actually engage the whole community and opening their door to bettering the transit system. Using public transit, we are the solution. I love it. I love it. Hopefully that was successful. <laughs> yeah. Was Hopefully we'll cool. be able to show that video. So, so Dan, um, in, in, in researching this and in, in, in watching, uh, you know, some of the, the content that you have out there about this, a, a thought comes to mind and that is, well, two thoughts actually, is I, I'm assuming that 
since Kingston's you know part of North America, and most likely it it got sort of developed around the automobile. Um, it's a fairly car centric environment, correct? Yeah, like I think just like probably Ann Arbor and other like some of those towns that are on the the you know other the coasts maybe a little bit earlier. You definitely got that downtown core, that square, right? But after that, you know, for a hundred years, yeah, hundred percent, yeah, yeah. The second thing is, and since you, you you had that opportunity to spend some time in Sweden and and be able to in, in, engage in and be involved with you know that environment of where uh, public transit is is very much a big you know part of of life there, uh, but so is is active mobility, walking and biking to meaningful destinations and, and all of that. Where are we at with the ability to walk and bike? in addition to using public transit, you know, for obviously we're talking about high school kids here. And, uh, and I'd like to also talk a little bit about the middle school kids, uh, as an add on to that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that, so the way I look at this is like the one thing that I've seen over the years, it kind of creates more of a narrative to become multimodal, right? Like not just getting out of your front door and sitting in a car and that's it. You know, that's it. There's no other choice, right? There's never thought. Like in my life, it could be walking to a bus stop. It could be walking or biking. It's just, it's that flexibility, right? And so I think we're constrained sometimes by our normalized behavior as well as our infrastructure. And it's a chicken and an egg game, right? So if more people are walking, paying attention to being multimodal and caring and advocating for it, uh, you know, our community in Kingston definitely has been making strides um, in different public infrastructure around bike paths, right? Uh, Both keeping them separate, making it apparent, you know, uh, bollards, that type of stuff. So there is definitely that play between these. I also remember one stat years ago from a health point of view that said that kids uh, or students are are 64% more likely to get their daily physical activity that's recommended if they take the bus because there's that walking and connection. And so I see this all as, I mean, sometimes it's hard to play it real time when we're talking about infrastructure because infrastructure takes some time, right? But I definitely, with my own child, you know, see how it ties into these other modes of confidence, understanding, understanding their community, how to get around, right? Even like where their place, their sense of place uh, and the confidence of navigating that system. I do have a really neat little story with that, but but I want to follow up to see, uh, yeah, what you were thinking with that. Yeah, no, I, I I love that that line of thought that you had, and it brought up uh, you you just you, you channeled and you mentioned your, your your own children, and and so this this image that you sent through came to mind. So this is the littles, <laughs> and then in the background we we've got the bus there, and then we also have somebody, you know, riding a bike on a street, which I would characterize as more of a, a of a European style street. It's it's got pavers and it's probably a treatment that's encouraging slower speeds. And so it takes me back to my time visiting Sweden as well as the Netherlands. Of uh, it, it's it may not be considered truly like protected infrastructure for riding a bike, but it's it's calmed. It's traffic calmed. Um, so yeah, I, I I guess that kind of brings us around to you know. What what level of like freedom and mobility are children in the Kingston area uh, granted now? It's sounding like the high school kids, you know, they're spot on. Now I'm starting to worry a little bit about some of the younger ones. Are they able to walk and bike to school? Are they able to, uh, you know, with some of the middle school kids, like, uh, for instance, in Boulder, Colorado, Whenever I'm riding the bus there, I'm like surrounded by middle schoolers on the bus, which is the coolest thing ever. Uh, and I know that you 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 get a, a a real good chuckle out of that because that's exactly what you're talking about. The you know empowering the kids to be able to use public transit to get to their daily needs. They're not relying on their parents or any other older siblings. Yeah, hundred percent, right. And what you're seeing too, I find with youth. So we have a couple of different programs, but one thing that you're seeing there too is that it's actually a field trip pass, right? Because in 2017, the city of Kingston at the time allowed zero to fourteen to ride for free. So I was talking to the director and saying, "Well, if kids ride free, can we just pay for the caregivers, the parents, the EAs, the you know, the different assistance and supports to?" to go for them. And they're like, yeah. And so usually, well, through COVID, it was a bit different, but I mean, I think one of our peak year was 900 field trips on our pre-existing public transit routes. And that just normalized at a young age, right? So now they're the sights, the smells, the movement, the payment, they got normalized, right? And I think that's, you know, part of them, not just going on their own at a young age, like in kindergarten, but starting to understand how to use it and, and being, and honestly, 
the bus is usually, this is what the parent, the teachers tell me, like their favorite, the kid's favorite trip depends on, or the favorite part of the trip would be them being on a bus, you know, which right. I think is always pretty cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too. Uh, and, and I can't, can't remember there, there's something that, that I saw in doing some research for this episode where it was talking a, a little bit about that concept of leveraging these buses, leveraging the transit that you have uh, to be able to do these field trips. Talk, talk a little bit more about that. Well, tr- a lot of our transit systems are really the, the built at the core around peak, uh, peak hours, which are before and after work and school, right? It's about commuter patterns, right? And so that usually leaves in some communities, it would leave more of a lull during the day. Uh, keep in mind, if you're talking about, you know, huge cities or, you know, it could be a bit different. There's a lot of mid-sized North American cities that kind of have this similar pattern, right? And so working really closely with Kingston Transit to you know, create a, create a bit of a system that makes sense, both for communications and marketing and etiquette and that type of stuff. You know, if 30 kids can show up randomly at a bus stop, it can slow down certain routes and stuff, but it's about a strong relationship and communication, you know, um, that is allowed for that. And, uh, and it's utilizing, you know, there's more bums in seats during the day, which sometimes that's when you see those empty buses, right? And so uh, the picture you showed there before, um, if, if anyone could imagine, it's like, it's old, that's actually Queen's University, one of Canada's oldest universities. So that's that kind of protected, more European, well, it was, you know, I think founded, I don't think I lie how many years, 200 years ago, maybe, right? It was quite old. Um, and so that's what you see there. But uh, yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's around that kind of, that narrative of, of getting them young, getting them to see it, normalizing it and, and getting parents and teachers to say, oh, you use the bus today? Because kids can teach up, you know? Right. But if I go to an adult, so you should use the bus tomorrow. And they'll tell me where to go and it won't be on a bus necessarily, you know? And so I think that's part of it too, is kids can normalize it, get excited about it, and then kind of train and tell their parents uh, as well. And that's, I think, what's creating the culture here um, from, you know, the earlier kids and then leading up to high school, which gives them more autonomy and value for full relationships in the community. That's what we're seeing, you know? Yeah. Are we also seeing that sense of autonomy and the sense of freedom re- resulting in uh, more kids being like, oh, yeah, I, I I can get to where I need to go. I can I can use transit. I can lean into. Are we seeing, you know, sort of the delay, especially in the high school, you know, of them feeling there's that pressure to have to get their driver's license and do that, you know, hey, no, I can jump on the bike or I can walk or I can leverage that and use public transit. I, I don't really need to to head down that direction of automobility and, and car brain thinking of I have to drive. Exactly. And I think I, well, I got stories for days, right. And, and instances. Um, but yeah, no, I like, for example, right now I have a, a college student that helping me with the placement of the get on the bus movement um, with the small change fund there, this national movement. Right. And so we'll, I know we'll be talking about that, but my point is when he's doing his placement with me in marketing communications, he's from Kingston he participated in the high school program. And the reason why he wants to support me, he said, was because of just the amount of impact it helped with him his life, right? Uh, one parent was at one side of town, um, you know, got him to school, work, volunteering. And so it's that type of thing. Another thing I like to draw up comparison to, which I find interesting, and this isn't a visual that I have. I forgot about this. I didn't remember the story that I was going to bring it up. But I remember seeing an article, I think it was in England years ago, where it was talking about the, the autonomy uh, different generations had over the years. And if you can imagine a big kind of circle, right? Like the great grandfather, it was like eight miles or something. They could wander the fields and go forever, right? You know, the grandfather, the father, and then the kid. And the kid was like basically nowhere, right? And even my daughter, when we, we lived in an apartment, when we moved to this house, she asked if she could go out front. And so it's that autonomy of the community. These kids are learning bus routes, timing, responsibility, getting around, place. And I think that's a part of what we're talking about and seeing as well. Yeah. Fascinating because, yes, it it talks about those generational levels of the fact that, you know, our our current generation, their world has shrunk to to the size size of, you know, very, very, very small. Uh, In some cases, you know, in some neighborhoods, it's literally the end of the driveway. Yeah. You know, there's the helicopter parents are like, no, I don't feel comfortable with you getting out of my sight even. And so uh, it it has a profound impact on, on the maturation and the uh, ability for, for children to, to actually turn into functioning adults. <laughs> so a hundred percent, actually, and I read this just the, I, uh, not too long ago, there was a pediatric journal that was talking about the mental well-being and, and 
uh, and the connection to autonomy and choice with youth and how that's declining. And, and there's a, there's a strong connection to mental health as well. Right. And I see it with my own, my own child. Right. And so that's why I think these things are so important. It looks different. Now it's not fields, you know, we're not collecting crayfish necessarily like I did as a kid, but this is, this is different. This is their environment. This is what they have, but the autonomy to move around confidence, understanding is what opens, I think, and brings community together too. Right. And I think that's uh, ties into the mental health side, you know, so you mentioned it earlier. So this is get on the bus, uh, CA .ca, the website, and you, you referenced this as a national movement now. Yeah. Across Canada. Um, you know, it's a, it's a thought and it's driven by, as I said, a charity called the small change fund, which is a great partner and collaborator on so many different uh, ch sustainable and ch uh, ch charitable initiatives across Canada. Basically what happened was, for about a decade, I've been running this in Kingston, working on it. I'm excited about it. I've done a TEDx and the Al Gore Climate Reality Project. Whenever anybody across, even Ithaca, New York, I was having conversations with, you know years ago with people from there before COVID. But whenever anyone stumbled across this work, whether it be researchers or passionate grassroots members or council members in other communities, I take the phone call. And I take the phone call and I, cause I love it. I just see it firsthand. Right. And I believe that it does so much good and I've seen it. And, and, uh, and that's what we're pulling out today. Uh, but in about 2001, I realized I kind of hit a wall of my capacity, right? Like there was no structure, there was no brand, there was no support. Uh, and a friend of mine, he said, well, you need time and money. And, and so how to find that was to find a good partner. And, uh, his name's Burkhard Mosberg. He's a very well-known Canadian, uh, in the environmental sector, uh, who'd started actually the small change fund. And I got, uh, got a hold of him kind of like, kind of like when I called you, uh, or emailed you and he's like, yeah, let's talk. And that's what together for about a year and a half, we wrote grants, uh, and we were funded, uh, to work at least the next couple of years on building this national movement of a network of communities across Canada, looking at youth friendly transit policy. Um, it has to be free for youth. But the thing is that what I've realized too, there's a lot of pressure nowadays with budgets and down on that lower level. It doesn't necessarily have to, it could be a collaboration of, you know, between funds and pre-existing dollars. And it doesn't just have to be free, uh, given by the transit authority, there's ways as communities can support it. And so, uh, trying to bring together that thought process, thought process across Canada, always answering phone calls, webinars, other resources. And then another big part of this too, because the policy one's, one's piece, but then there's the training aspect and trying to help, help create systemic ability to help other communities train their youth, right? And whether that be digitizing resources or train the trainer modules or webinars or calls or supporting them where they are, because every community is a bit different, you know, and, and transportation systems could be a bit different. So really taking this core knowledge of what we've established in Kingston and helping bring it across Canada and honestly across North America. Um, in 2017, there's a master's thesis that said it could be applied to help drive youth independence and transit future transit ridership. And so, you know, knowing all this and seeing it firsthand has just kind of been a spark in my life to just keep on talking about it and sharing the story and, and supporting and learning from others that are doing it themselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you said that was right around 2021. So right during the height of the pandemic. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly. And so it was 2023 in June, we started uh, Get on the Bus, uh, getonthebus.ca, which you'll see a bit more about it. Uh, if anyone's listening, please reach out if you're interested to learn more or other resources. But yeah, um, it was then and, and we've been working actively supporting communities, advocating for it and creating resources to help others. Yeah. Fantastic. And again, this is the website, getonthebus.ca. So folks, be sure to uh, head on over there. Uh, Dan, I'm going to pop on over to your uh, community solutions uh, website as well. Um, so, you know, clearly you're, you're passionate about this. You, you've got your part-time gig over there. You've got your other thing that you're doing over there. It sounds like you're also serving as a consultant and an innovator and helping other folks, even taking calls, you know, from south of the border <laughs> when us uh, Americans call you and say, help, help. Uh, so is that sort of the, is this the umbrella that you're sort of operating with that in terms of being able to, to provide guidance to folks? Well, everything, yeah, like structurally, um, everything I do on this um, outside of Kingston is through Get on the Bus through the Small Change Fund. Um, and so, it, but, but what the beautiful thing is, if you're on, the, on my website, dhentry.com, the reason why I consolidated and made a website about myself really was because for all those years that all the resources were scattered and no one had anywhere to go. So every time I created that timeline and stuff, but everything moving forward. Yeah. If there's any support and, and consulting or anything like that, uh, definitely taking it through the charity just to help support the work as a whole. Right. And so um, do I do other consulting for other sustainable initiatives and climate action? Yes. But anything through my passion uh, is through the partnership with the small change fund. 
I love it. I love it. Talk a little bit about the small change fund. It is it, you, you, you mentioned it in passing there for a second. Uh, what's the story behind that organization? Uh, well, it's uh, so the small change fund, it's it catalyzes. And again, I work with them. Right. And so I might not have the, the perfect explanation of all the tentacles because they're doing so much. Um, but it was actually one of Canada's kind of like a GoFundMe, but for charities. Right. And so the, the, the idea is, is it's a charity. But there's a lot of grassroots movements and partners that maybe don't have structure or need support. And what this does is allows for a community and a platform to to raise funds for their different initiatives. I think there's over 120 partners. They work on a variety of things tied to social justice, uh, indigenous reconciliation and climate, and just generally a great group of people to work with. And so uh, what you can see there, actually, yeah, there's uh, the Get On The Bus um, uh, crowdfunding page. And so that's one of their cores, uh, but they also offer just so much, especially for someone like myself that was, you know, uh, maybe a bit of a uh, a lone wolf talking about this for a long time um, in the way of outside of Kingston. There's definitely a lot of support and people and active players in Kingston working on executing the program here. Um, but yeah, once we uh, we found them, like uh, Forrest would say, it's peas and carrots. And, you know, since then I have looked back, you know, it's, it's the support that this movement needs, you know? Yeah. That is fascinating. Yeah, that's great. Oh, so yeah, so that's that's cool. That really is a platform for being able to do some of the fundraising for the other nonprofits. Gives you that uh, that umbrella, that arm to be able to do that. So that that makes complete sense. I want to play a short little video here from the mayor of, of Kingston because uh, that was one of my thoughts. Was like, okay, so yeah, where's the politicians on all this? And are they supportive of this? And and uh, the fine mayor uh, was able to answer this for me because I think this is kind of cool. And after, uh, this is only like 90 seconds long, so we can chat a little bit about that when it's done. Perfect. Here in Kingston, we're making increasing youth ridership on public transit a key priority, not only to increase social equity and travel independence, but also to create long-term transit users in the city. Since we introduced the free high school transit program back in 2012, we've seen enormous success, uptake from students across the city. What this program does is it allows high school students better access to job opportunities, to extracurricular activities, to shopping, participation in community events, while at the same time helping them feel empowered with their travel decisions. It also teaches them time management skills and helps to build their confidence in moving around our city by navigating our public transportation system. As mayor, I've seen firsthand the positive impact that this program has on youth in our city and how it really is creating long-term transit users. But this program is also helping us as a city to meet our climate change goals by encouraging and educating young people to take active transportation options. It means fewer vehicles on the road, reduced emissions and improved air quality. Many of our students even have the chance to ride our state-of-the-art electric buses, which we've recently rolled out. I'm so proud of the work we've done here in Kingston, partnership with the local school boards to introduce free transit for high school students. I encourage you to look at other ways that you can reduce barriers and get youth on transit in your community. It's great for the city and the goals that you want to achieve, but it's also great for youth in your community, helping to support and equip them for the future. Fantastic. Nice. Um, it was obviously well prepared. Good notes. <laughs> well delivered. <laughs> it, it, it's it really is encouraging. And again, it, it 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 leads me to think that next step is is how about that first and last mile or kilometer. Point six <laughs> or whatever it is, yeah, exactly. you know, it, because it, I mean, ultimately, that's our biggest challenge right in North America is that, yeah, I mean, be great if there's if there's good, uh, effective transit and there's good headways and and it's getting to meaningful destinations. And, but then it's like, OK, yeah, can I get to transit and can I get to my meaningful destinations when I get off of transit? hundred percent, you know, and I think now, you know, over a decade in watching this and seeing it and actually students like maturing out and using it and talking about it. I think that's part of that. Now, some of these different decisions, you know, will take different time lengths, right? Infrastructure, things like that, t technology that's available. But I go back to like in that, in the short video of the climate reality, when, when I said, you know, it takes a uh, good transit, you know, uh, for basically for people to use, but you need people to use good transit. Right. And I, I think this extends too to that last mile idea. 
the more people that are using transit, taking the walking to the bus stops, you know, using it effectively, there's going to be more pressure and advocacy to, to see those other pieces of that last mile. You know, um, we're building in an environment that has been, they're going to have constraints from an environmental point of view because we built infrastructure, right? Um, but I think it does help with, with bringing attention when people are using it and advocating to continually to build. And it goes to the GHG point too. We can electrify all our buses, but if people aren't using them, you know, that's not helping, right? And so I really fundamentally believe from a climate point of view, technology point of view, last mile health, all that, it is that balance of we got to get people on the bus we, and then we can build better routes, more routes, more people, more routes, more people, and then more attention to things that tie into the bigger picture about location, land use development, last mile, all those other pieces, you know? Yeah, yeah. What is the sort of the the result of all of this. I mean, we've got an, we've had enough time. We've seen some of the data, the ridership numbers, you know, from the program itself, uh, 600,000 plus, you know, uh, prior to, 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 you know, the, the pandemic and all of that it has, and obviously transit everywhere took a hit during the pandemic. And I'm assuming it, it happened there as well. Uh, but now post pandemic reality, 2003, going into 2000, 2023, going into 2024. Where are we at on the whole modal shift or, or modal breakdown? I mean, how many people are routinely riding transit for to meet their daily needs uh, and, and walking and biking versus jumping in a single occupancy vehicle? Um, I know there are stats available. I don't have them currently in front of me because they are produced by the city of Kingston, the municipality, um, which they did a deep dive on kind of the, the multi, the use, the usage breakdown. Right. And so but what I can say from my knowledge of what we've created through this system is in 2017, it was a big year because that was the year that, uh, you know, the fare changed and, and they actually created a youth pass. So after high school, I think it's from 15 to 24. So if you're not in high school or up to 24, you can buy a discounted monthly pass. And that past sales have gone up 140% from 2017 to 2023, showing the correlation of monthly pass purchases after high school, right? And so that's driving ridership, which is one data point that I think is really important. I mean, it's not the same, but, you know, when I walk out in the community or if I'm on the bus, like I'm the bus guy, right? Like literally thousands of kids that have seen me for that 20 minutes but that's what I always think is crazy. I've only been on the bus with each group for 20 minutes. Yes, it's all of them. And it's a very repetitive time of year for me. I say the presentation a lot. My voice is really cracked by the end of it. But a lot of them still recognize me. And I think how impactful is that? First, yeah, it's early. Grade nine is important too, by the way. I like to bring this up because your whole family is going through a transition to high school, right? Like you're growing up. The family's growing up. Right. And so that's when I think it's a really pivotal point, too. And they're young enough to I don't mean listen, but they, they're they they're eager. Right. They're still it's a little bit their shoes are too big. They're not growing up yet. You know, and that's just like my own daughter. She's on grade 10. Right. And so what we've seen is, I think, just just the amount of, of comments um, from from things like like during the during the day field trips, not just the field trip, but the location they're going, they're selling out theater events during the day and other things that used to not always be that way. And, and so for me, it's about taking all these kind of small data points or observations to kind of weave together the bigger story. But yeah, that's what I would say from a whole, it's just been really neat to see. And then other things like parents saying, you know, a friend of mine uh, or a colleague of mine, she said, actually, when we visited Vancouver, like Canada on the West Coast, I was going to rent a car and my, said, my, mom's, or my son said, mom, don't bother. I'll figure out the transit system. We'll get downtown. No problem. Right. And so it's that transferable skill set and mindset that they can take wherever they go, wherever they come to Arizona, they go to New York City, wherever there's transit. Transit might look a little different, but the skill set's there and the confidence is there. Right. And I think that's important. I'm really glad you, you brought that up, too, because, you know, I had mentioned uh, that, you know, when I jump on the bus there in Boulder, I'm seeing, you know, the middle schoolers on the bus and I'm seeing, uh, you know, the high schoolers using the bus. But they're 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 also admittedly also walking and biking a lot, too, in, in that community. But part of of that is somebody has taught them that skill. Someone had shown them that. And that's a really good point to what you're talking about. Cause you're, you, and you're, you're I, I had to chuckle when you were talking about, you know, how you get recognized by an entire generation of kids, you know, that remember, oh yeah, you're the bus guy. 
uh, I had the same thing living in Hawaii when I was the bike ed, you know, teacher and, and I would go around to each of the elementary schools and teach the fourth graders. And, and, you know, I'd see them, you know, years later and they're like, oh yeah, John, you know, et cetera, you, you, you up to that. And of course in Hawaii, they would always, you know, uh, an elder, uh, a male elder is always, you know, considered uh, uncle. And so uncle John, uncle John, <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, it's, it's good. Now earlier you had mentioned, you know, it's even stimulated, this process has has uh, stimulate, I guess, is a good word. You know, master's thesis and, and and other types of study. Uh, you sent through this the design for social innovation and case studies from around the world. Talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so this was an opportunity I kind of saw on LinkedIn. It was uh, it was around user design, you know, and it was around how to create interventions to 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 move social innovation for that that side of not just innovation in a product but an inter- intervention in a process potentially or something for societal good. And I submitted, yeah, I submitted a, a bit of a, an abstract, I think, of some of the work that's been done to date um, and they loved it. And uh, yeah, it made this international book for, for social innovation and design. And so uh, it's published in there, which is purchasable online. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's just every time in my life that I've seen an opportunity to tell the story different ways I have, you know, because I don't feel like, you know, I don't know how much impact it will. I feel like I'm trying my best, but I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an archeologist. Well, I wasn't maybe as uh, astute of a student to do that, but I know this is the medium and the story and the narrative that I have to repeat uh, because it's special, right? And what I've seen parents time, access to school, sports, volunteering, work, continuing to use ridership, right? Confidence, access, to mental health or other resources, like that's where I really see it could shift transit systems and lead to to healthier communities because I'm watching it, right? Like I'm watching the confidence of my own daughter who has autism. You know, she might not drive, but she can use the bus now. And there's, there's a whole bunch of different people that can use it for different ways. And for me, now that we see more than ever, I think you probably see it in the States too, is some, some information that's all over the place on social media. This is about building community, right? And confidence in community with trust. and. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, anytime I get to tell a story, um, I try, you know, and so, and just like today, and I appreciate this, you know, I, I love that too. And I love the title of, of this little piece here. And it's, it's a title that I see in, in multiple locations, including on, uh, some of the videos is throwing car culture under the bus. Yeah, that was come up. Actually, we created that. Uh, I was lucky enough in 2009 to do a TEDx um, in Ottawa. So the capital city of Canada on the National Arts Centre stage. There's maybe 800 people. I, my dog could have repeated that talk to you. I can tell you that much. I said it so many times. Uh, <laughs> but it was my coach at the time there. You, you have a coach. Um, and they, they said, we got to find a, a really good title. And it was kind of, yeah, his name was Terry. And, and he did a, he thought of that. And I've used it for certain things because I think it's a, it's that cultural piece. Because the other things I find is sometimes when I'm talking to adults that don't use the bus or never use the bus or don't think about this, it's not their day. There's a lot of barriers. Yeah, well, I need it for this reason. Oh, I can't do this. But it's not about everything. It's about a piece. And I think that's why our we are normalized around a culture because our environment is dictating it. And there's, positive and negative feedback cycles for anything in human or not in human, but are being a human. Right. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was about, let's talk about this, you know, like, you know, there's so many good things about moving and exercise and whatever health related, right. Ac- obviously is a big part of what you do. Um, and this is just a piece of an intervention that can help in so many ways, you know? Yeah. I love it. And we'll be sure to include the links uh, to, uh, you know, all of these different uh, studies and videos, including your TED Talk uh, as well. And this is just a fascinating, fascinating area of study and passion area of work that you're, you're working on. Is there another community that has really seen what you have achieved in Kingston and just run with it? Well, I would say that uh, not 10 years in, but there's definitely, um, there's a lot of communities and that's what Get On The Bus is about, building that network, sharing knowledge, maybe a community of practice and webinars and expertise and training and structures and, find, you know, trying to get through barriers like costing and, and doing, a, I'm, I'm working, trying to find money for a, a cost benefit analysis that really shows how much money is this, 
what's, what value is this creating for communities? How much money are we spending on kids getting to mental health things or getting to school or parents' time or GHGs, greenhouse gases? Like, what is that, right? And so, yeah, like Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia has a pilot project they're working on. Victoria, British Columbia. So coast to coast in Canada. That's like LA and New York. You know what I mean? Not as big. Don't get me wrong, eh? I give you an A there too. Um, but uh, yeah, no, there's definitely multiple communities in Canada. And since we've been advocating for it too, since even 2023, Oakville, Burlington. So more and more communities are we're seeing this work, whether it be the body of work that we've created or created in Kingston or the, the amplification and support we have with Get on the Bus, right? Really, it's the Get on the Bus is what it is now, right? I do my Kingston work. I keep it going. Um but what we're doing nationally, I think, is pretty special. And yeah, it's uh, there's about 11 or 12 communities. I just read one the other day. It just popped up. And see, that's that beauty of the movement where they're using this information. They're using the body of work. They're contacting if they have specific questions. Well, how do we angle it this way if we're doing a presentation? Or do you have any stats on this? You know, And we have all that consolidated. And we just support uh, communities where they are, whether it be a trustee, a, a staff member, a parent. You know, Where are you? What are you interested in? Let's have a conversation. You know? Yeah, yeah. And is there anything that you would kind of boil it down, your experience that you've had? Um, if, a, if a community is reaching out, they're just learning about this and getting really, really inspired with this. What would you say is the very first thing that they should do? And if you had a word of caution for them, you know, hey, make sure you do this too. <laughs> yeah, I think that one thing is just to look at what's happening. Like take the time to to look at the communities, what are the action plans at different institutions, you know, what are what are their operational plans, strategic plans, what are some different grassroots organizations or partnerships that exist? You know, it's always easier starting where something is, right? Finding different narratives too, right? I could talk to you about this, about the health benefits, the environmental benefits, the youth autonomy, the education, the parent time, like there are so many values. So if you're looking at something like this, what is the priority in your community? Right? What are act? What's actively being talked about? What, how what could resonate with different groups of people? Um, that's one thing. A uh, 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 caution would be not always just putting it on uh, you know the municipality. Sometimes depending on the structure, potentially whether it be a city, right, the, uh, the state or the province in Canada, the federal. Like where are resources and and with civics, like who's responsible for what, right? And and how could you kind of align some of that uh, if right? The other thing I would say is a beautiful word. I think we use it more nowadays in different things, but a pilot, it doesn't have to, like I've seen people give me the, like uh, a community in Canada said, well, we can't do that because if we did that tomorrow, we couldn't have, we could, uh, our transit system couldn't compa- have that capacity. It's like, well, you, first thing, do you assume that you're going to do what we did after a decade tomorrow? Well, that's a nice assumption. But also the idea of what about one grade, one school, one group, where can you start? And that's what I always say, because a lot of people are saying, well, we can't do this because we don't have the money. If that's the case, where do you start to start creating the narrative, creating the partnerships, right? And I think, I think in every community, there's a starting point. Uh, and that's what Get On The Bus, uh, you know, driven by the Small Change Fund's about is working with them to start having those conversations of, well, what could it look like, you know, and, uh, and what partners exist? Yeah, yeah. And I pulled up the, uh, you know, Get On The Bus, Get Ready to Get On The Bus, the, you know, this is how we get started uh, page here on the website. So yes, uh, also you know, as your first step, make sure you head on over to the website and click on that page uh, and get over there. Dan, this has been so much fun. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure that we leave the audience with? Uh, well, g- get to the website, I guess, but we covered that. It's no, uh, no, it's more of just, I, I hope that any of those, you know, people listening, whether they're interested in active transportation or health or transit or youth or whatever aspect, I hope they consider, you know, looking into something like this because I've seen it just do good, you know, and that's why I'm here talking today. So, no, I really appreciate the platform, the time, your questions, the the, the, the overview of everything. And maybe we'll do a check in in a year or two to see how many more other communities because it's rolling in Canada. Um, and it'd be nice to get some American counterparts and, and support some other communities uh, to try to look at doing something similar, you know. So thanks again for the time. Yeah, you are you are quite welcome. And in in my pitch, you know, since this is going out globally too, is that 
yeah, I mean, transit shouldn't shouldn't be like this scary thing that's that's you know it's just kind of out there and like I don't know who who's doing that, uh, who's using it. I think I saw one of the the, the buses, you know, the creepy, and, the, <laughs> and it was like, no, 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 it's it, it shouldn't be this scary thing. And to your point too, it's like it, it is a skill. Once it's a, once you learn how to use transit, um, it becomes pretty intuitive. And then yeah, you, it's sort of empowering. You don't have to feel like when you travel to a, a different city that you're gonna have to. Oh my gosh, I gotta rent a rental car and be able to do that. No, it's more like okay, let's figure out you know what is the ability to to be able to use transit to get to our ultimate destination when we get there. So yeah, it's 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 very empowering to have that feel like you have that skill set. I think it is a skill, you know, and I think it's always funny when we travel and we go to beautiful places and we're like, oh, wasn't it great? We walked and biked and bust and then we'll go home. Like, but those are communities too, right? And so, yeah, it's how do we learn and continue to to, to better our communities, uh, to be more honestly equal, accessible, um, community minded, you know, and I think uh, that's a big thing that I'm very proud of. I just feel that, you know, accessing the community is hard if you don't have transportation and and there's a lot of resources and, and just doesn't matter if my daughter's going to play Dungeons and Dragons, that's what she does, you know, and and to find community, you have to be able to get to community, I think too. And uh, and that's what I'm, I'm hopeful for. So yeah, anyone listening, if they want to reach out and, and share their stories or learn more, I would be happy to have conversations, you know. Love it. I love it. Well, Dan Hendry, this has been such an honor and pleasure chatting with you here today. Thank you for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Gil. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Dan Hendry. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just navigate over to activetowns.org, click on the support button. And there's several different options, including becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, those of you out on Patreon do have access to all of this video content early and ad free. And uh, hey, every little bit adds up and is much appreciated. Uh, and until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.